Hello everyone, this is the CircuitPython Weekly for April 8th, 2021. It's the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Jeff, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. It's April 5th, thank you. Um, CircuitPython is a version of Python to design... To <laughs> CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. If the meeting time is changed, we'll notify you via Discord. If you wish to be notified about changes to the meeting, we can add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There is also a calendar available that we keep updated, so you can subscribe to that. There is a link in the notes document. This meeting is recorded. We record the audio from the voice channel and the video of the text channel. If you'd rather not have your voice recorded, you are still welcome to participate. The video will be posted to YouTube and an audio-only version released as a podcast. If you can't find us on your favorite podcast service, please let us know. There is a notes document to accompany the meeting and recording. If you wish to participate but can't make the meeting, that's the place to leave your hug reports and status updates. We'll add uh, timestamps to the document to go along with the video so you can use the doc to find only the parts of the video that interest you the most. The meeting tends to run 60 to 90 minutes, so it's good to have the option to skip around. Uh, a link to the notes document is posted in the CircuitPython channel on the Adafruit Discord every week. Check the pinned messages to find the latest document. This meeting is held in five parts. The first part is community news, which is a preview of the Python on Microcontrollers newsletter and a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware. The second part is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka, a statistical overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers. The third part is Hug Reports, an opportunity to highlight the good things folks around us are doing and a moment to take the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. The fourth part is Status Updates. Status Updates is the opportunity to sync up on what we've been up to. Take a couple of minutes, tell us what you've been doing in the time since our last meeting, and what you'll be up to before the next one. The fifth part is In the Weeds, an opportunity for long-form discussion. These discussions can come out of status updates or be something you've identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. And that covers the major parts of the meeting. With that, I need to find the right spot in the notes document take a time code and tell you about the CircuitPython community news. And um, I hope Foamy Guy can drop the links in. I did not arrange that with you beforehand. Uh, but we've got a plethora of CircuitPython keyboards and macro pads from Reddit. Thanks, Foamy Guy. Using the Dazzler and Gameduino CircuitPython to create a sprite animation from Tiny Letter. How to use CircuitPython with GPIO pins on a PC from Tom's Hardware. A Raspberry Pi macro pad from jmdawson.co.uk. And a Circuit Playground Ambient Weather Reactive Orb. That's a very rectangular orb. Uh, and that one is from the Adafruit Forum. Um, yeah, and the, the cubicle picture that I'm talking about is in the notes doc, so check that out. Uh, that's just a tiny sample of what is coming from the CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter, emailed every Tuesday, aka tomorrow. The complete archives are on adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. We aim to highlight the latest Python and hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or project, you can edit next week's draft on GitHub and submit a pull request with the changes. You can also tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email cpnews at adafruit.com. Um, if you're thinking, oh, my project is too small to be in the newsletter, it's not. We love to show what people are doing and um, showing people at every skill level that they can begin and get started and 
do an interesting project is one of the things that uh, is really, I think, key to the whole idea. Anyway, uh, that wraps up community news. And next, we will go on to the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Basically, uh, every week, we pull a bunch of stats from GitHub, summarizing what happened over approximately the previous week, and um, also add a little bit of narrative um, about how we see the project progressing as a whole. So overall, in the last week, we had 40 pull requests merged from 22 authors. Um, so some names that are less familiar to me are J. Pudev, um, Mbyte, and then we have some people who uh, have been pretty consistently contributing lately, uh, Bergdahl, Kmatch, um, yeah, a lot of these these names are less familiar. Ryan G14, I think we've had before. Um, Lai Yuspov uh, is another one I'm unfamiliar with. So thanks to all those authors. Um, when you are contributing to CircuitPython, you really help us advance the project. Um, and also, I want to thank the eight reviewers. Um, it's people we're familiar with seeing. Um, but if you can help out by commenting on pull requests, giving pull requests a test, um, just generally giving feedback, and if you um, want to advance to actually being able to review, which means you can mark a pull request to be accepted, we are happy to add these people because that's what enables us to um, turn these contributions into high quality contributions that we are uh, happy to, to bring into the fold. And anyway, the last overall number is we had 22 closed issues by 11 people and 22 opened by 16 people. Um, so we were net up two issues, which um, kind of overall the trend is to more open issues. But it's good to see the numbers of people um, involved. So with that, I will pass it to Scott to tell us about what's going on in the core. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, numbers for the core. We had eight pull requests merged uh, from nine different authors, which is amazing. Uh, Mbyte is a new author here, so shout out to them. Uh, we had three reviewers, Gambler21, uh, Jepler, and Dan Halbert. So thank you to our three reviewers. As always, we're looking to level folks up into the reviewing role because that means that uh, more people can get their code reviewed and merged in. We have 21 open pull requests. Um, a number of those are aging, so we should take a look at those. Um, maybe I'll get some time this week to do that. Uh, but if anybody's looking for things to do, uh, picking up old pull requests is really, really helpful. You may, uh, after you read through an existing pull request, you may see that there's like a few things to do to finish it up, and it could be really helpful. I know, uh, in particular, there is one pull request that is for an ESP32 S2 board, uh, specifically, and that pull request came along before Espresso was giving out uh, USB PIDs. So uh, that is an example of a pull request that I, I suspect somebody could pick up and finish, which would be amazing. Um, so that's my plug. <laughs> issues wise, we had four closed issues by three people and seven open by four people. So we are uh, net positive, which is uh, not always the good thing, but we, we try to be as, uh, as aggressive as we can. So we have 419 total open issues which you can see by going to github.com slash Adafruit slash CircuitPython slash issues. Uh, we have six active milestones. Um, this is, we have two open for 620, which I think is going to go out today. Uh, we'll hear more from Dan later about that. Um, and we uh, have 53 open issues for 70. So that's uh, a, a change. Uh, Dan's gone over through these. So we use milestones to triage the issues we're working on. Um, we have four open support issues, which I suspect we could close. And uh, we have two issues not assigned to milestone, so we'll want to make sure and take a look at those. Um, overall, Dan's been taking the lead on 6.2, which has been great. And uh, we've already turned the corner on main. So the main branch is now 7.0. So if there are changes that need to be done be, uh, that are... Um, that will cause us to break APIs, make sure uh, those can happen on main now, because uh, whatever we release from there on will be marked as seven, um, which is exciting. And it unlocks some stuff. So 
Uh, thank you, everybody, for that. And I'll uh, hand it back to Jeff. Yeah, and the incompatibilities have already started. Um, so if your microlab code doesn't work anymore, that is because you'll have to change it. But we'll talk more about that later. Uh, I will now pass it to Katni, who has been taking notes for me, thank you very much, to tell us about the libraries. All right, thanks, Jeff. So this section applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries. That's everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a few extras, including the CircuitPython community bundle. We had 31 pull requests merged uh, with a couple of the names that you mentioned earlier, um, 14 authors total, and seven reviewers. Um, we had, wow, um, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, five, uh, merged pull requests that were older than a week um older than yeah older than a week most of them were older than two weeks which is excellent to see that we're um picking up some of those older pull requests and getting them taken care of um and it's also pretty clear that we're staying on top of a lot of new ones uh we had or that leaves us with 57 open pull requests which is up but i know that we've been working on um some new stuff as well so that's not entirely surprising um, we had 15 closed issues by 10 people and 14 opened by 11, leaving us with 315 open issues. Six of those are labeled good first issues. Um, if you're looking to contribute to CircuitPython on the Python side, uh, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all this information, um, open pull requests, open issues, and library infrastructure issues. Um, you can search the issues by label, good first issue, as I mentioned. Uh, is a great place to start if you're new to uh, contributing to open source in general. Um, if you're looking for something a little more complicated, look for bug or enhancement. Um, if you want to get started reviewing, take a look at any of the open PRs. Uh, you can just post a comment to them, say you took a look. If you have the hardware, give it a test. Um, let us know that you did. That's always helpful, regardless of what it is that you do. It's always helpful to have another set of eyes on a PR. Um, so we greatly appreciate that. And that's a great way to get started reviewing. Once you are more comfortable with things, that's when we can level you up to um, actually joining the review team. Uh, so that's a way to, um, to do that without um, necessarily jumping right into it if that's not what you're prepared to do. Uh, in terms of library updates in the last week, we have one new library, Adafruit Circuit Python Funhouse, and a number of updated libraries, um, including the community bundle. Uh, but I will not list all of them off. Um, and that's where we are with the libraries. Thank you, Katni. And the last subsection, um, Maker Melissa will tell us about the state of Blinka. Hello. Um, for Blinka, which is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for Raspberry Pi and other single board computers uh, this week, uh, we had one pull request merged by one author and one reviewer. And that leaves a, we have eight open pull requests at this point between the different repos. Uh, there was one closed issue by one person and one opened by one person, leaving a net of 55 open issues. And there were 275 PyPI downloads in the last week, and we are currently supporting 70 boards. And if you'd like to contribute to Blinka, uh, as Katty had mentioned, uh, you can go ahead and either uh, help with reviewing pull requests that are outstanding, or you can submit them, uh, either bugs or enhancements or whatever else you want. Thanks. Thank you. And now we moved to our first uh, round robin section, which is hug reports. And um, I will start and then I will read some notes from Jose David and after that pass to Katni. So uh, I want to start with a group hug and apologize for being a little bit um, disorganized today. The other hug that I know I want to give is to um, GitHub user the flow one who um, contributed an enhancement to one of the libraries. There was a issue that had been filed um, saying, you know, this, uh, there seems to be an arbitrary limitation. Um, and I looked into it a little bit and said, yeah, it looks like that is just kind of arbitrary and the number can be increased. And they filed a pull request and I was able to merge it and now everybody is happy. So, I mean, that's a really good outcome and a new contributor, 
whether they'll return or not, I don't know, but it's always fun to see that happening um, in the world and, and to make it happen. And I forgot to take my time code. Um, all right, so Jose David, who is text only today, has a hug report for Naradoc for pointing the right direction to modify the Adabot script to make the page list community libraries. A hug to Johnny Bergdahl for his first PR, and a hug report to all WebLate translators, all languages. You make CircuitPython easier for more people. Your work is important. Thanks for keeping this up. And let's continue the fun competition. Uh, so next is Katni and then Kmatch. All right, so I have a very short list today because I also forgot to add notes until right before the meeting. Um, so a hug report to everybody who sent in newsletter topics. Uh, I know I got emails um, from a couple internal folks, but also from David Glauda. So thank you very much for those. Um, and thank you to Jay Posada 2020 for submitting a PR to the newsletter with a uh, news of, from around the web submission. Um, and a hug report to everyone I missed this week. I'm sure I'm forgetting things that I meant to hug report. Like I said, I did not get to my notes until right before the meeting and a group hug. Thank you. Uh, after Kmatch, it's Melissa. Good. Thanks, Jeff. So first off, uh, first hug goes to David Glauda for some tips on memory saving in CircuitPython. Uh, next was thanks to Mark Gamblor and uh, two users on GitHub, Charkster and MarkB139, uh, which has a lot of great groundwork on uh, how to use microcontrollers uh, as uh, logic analyzers. And a related note, um, for all the work on tiny USB, uh, TAC uh, has has built a great, uh, and I guess the community members have built a great capability. And especially want to call out another user, PyGru, who has one special capability using uh, USB to talk to test and measurement equipment. So there's a huge asset there, and it's, a, it's great to see all the work and makes life a lot easier to use that. Hey, thanks. Thank you. Uh, all right. After Melissa, I'll read notes from Mark. I wanted to give a hug report to Dan H for tackling the circuitpython.org with the new release. I know he was having a little trouble with it. Uh, to a hug report to Nikita UT for submitting a pull request to fix the web serial 3D model viewer. And a group hug to everyone else. All right. Um, after this, I will pass it to Scott, but Mark writes a hug report to Kevin J. Waters, Tanute, Jeff, and Davey Thatcher for review comments on the audio mixer. Uh, after Tanute, we will head back to the top of the alphabet, and I bet I have notes to read. No, it will be Ask Patrick. So go ahead, Scott. Hello, hug report to Trevor, who works on iOS for Adafruit here, uh, for jumping in on CircuitPython, got him going last week, uh, running CircuitPython on stuff. Uh, hug reports to Dan H for release managing 6.2.0 and for the interrupts as a, as exceptions idea. Ideas are good even when they prove to be troublesome. So I just want to encourage everybody to really be creative and uh, and put ideas out there. So Dan, thank you for doing that uh, and leading the way. And last up, uh, hug report to Tiomich for the core contributions. Really happy to see lots of lots of fixes and additions coming from Tiomich. So thanks to them. All right. Thank you. Uh, Ask Patrick W. Hello. We don't hear from you a lot. Hello. Yeah. Sorry. I usually am watching these in the middle of the night. So, uh, <laughs> but today my schedule permits me to join, and I wanted to do a deep dive later. Uh, hey, thanks to David uh, Jose David M for their work on adding the list of libraries and descriptions to the community bundle repo. It's always cool when I open an issue thinking I'll fix it, but then someone else does it. And a group hug to everybody. I mean, I'm always kind of lurking around the back room, and this is a really great community and a fun place to participate. So I appreciate it. All right, thank you. Hope uh, you have more opportunities to join us in the future. All right, uh, I'll pass it to Dan and then read notes from David Cloud. Thank you. Okay, so thanks to Lucian, who's working on sleep on the STM32 port, and he's reviewed uh, Jundu Sack's NRF sleep uh, pull request, which has been really helpful, as having a second set of eyes on that. And also, um, we've had several discussions in which he, uh, Lucian has pointed out, like, said, like, why is the sleep code doing this? And it was like, oh, that's actually, it shouldn't be doing that. So that's very helpful. Um, Thanks to John Tusak, who's persisting on the sleep uh, PR for NRF, even though it's been like a month now, but we keep deferring it for various reasons. 
Uh, thanks to Johnny Bergdahl, who's been translating Swedish for a long time, and finally said, I don't really like these English error messages that much. They could be better. And he submitted a PR for that. So that's great to have the translators saying, commenting on the quality of the messages and not just doing the translation. That's really helpful. Thanks to Scott for starting in earnest working on BLE uh, workflow and in the process found several longstanding BLE issues. Thanks to Katni for doing the CircuitPython newsletter uh, the past few weeks uh, and producing really excellent results while, while Anne is away. Thanks to uh, B. Patrizic and Marcos Diaz who uh, found an HID error on macOS, which I thought I was quick to dismiss as a macOS problem, but it turns out we had actually changed something. Uh, it's still a macOS problem, but it's not. there's not quite as much finger pointing. Um, and thanks to Deshipu, who looked at his old issues that were marked long term and cleaned some of them up. That's really helpful. OK. All right, I have a couple of people's notes to read, and then up after that will be Foamy Guy. Uh, David Gloud sends a uh, hug report. Thanks to all the YouTube streamers and friends. It's great to learn about design and implementation of an API, discover new project ideas, see how an engineer thinks about what parts to use, how to run a company, new products, etc. To Dan H for all the releases, RC0, but also all those before, and to Rakantha Michael Horn for progress on the Pico quarter. There is a link in the notes doc. Um, about that if you're interested. And Deshipu says a hug to Dan H and everyone involved for figuring out the mystery of the macOS HID mouse. So next up is uh, Foamy Guy and then Hierofact. All right, thanks Jeff. Um, this week, uh, first hug to Scott and Trevor for getting started on the BLE uh, workflow for CircuitPython and iOS. I'm excited about that, keeping an eye on it and hoping to work on the Android side of that implementation. Um, and then also thanks to Jose David for many great uh, improvements in Display.io across a bunch of different libraries and creating new widgets and the new uh, styles library. Um, Jose has been doing a bunch of great work on Display.io stuff, so appreciate all of that. Uh, and that's all for me. Thanks. All right. I'll pass it to Higher Effect, and then after that, Hugo will get to round out the section. Alrighty, uh, this week, thanks a bunch to uh, Dan for continued and greatly appreciated help on uh, understanding parts of the Deep Sleep API. Um, and uh, also thanks to Dan and Warrior and Wire uh, and all the others in the uh, GitHub um, for interesting discussions uh, regarding the interrupts, uh, interrupt systems and ideas uh, which may end up impacting the Alarm API. And uh, thanks to you, Jeff, for your continued work on uh, IMX, getting some new modules in there. That's very cool. And that's it for me. All right, uh, Hugo, go ahead. Great. Um, <clears throat> first of all, thanks to uh, Bergdahl, or Johnny Bergdahl, as we see him sometimes, uh, for catching that potentially confusing error message uh, for memory management and making it easier for everyone. Uh, second, a uh, report for the web like gangs, quote unquote, uh, for just helping each other on and keeping each other honest and just encouraging each other. And finally, group hug for the community. Thank you. That rounds out hug reports and brings us to status updates. In status updates, we want to hear what you've been up to since the last meeting and what you'll be up to before the next one. And Feel free to go a little bit outside the bounds of CircuitPython and tell us about something that's going on in your life if you feel like sharing. Once again, I will kick off. I haven't put in my notes before the meeting, so I'll just kind of wing it. But uh, the majority of my time last week, I spent on the PWM output on the IMX RT microcontrollers. That is in pretty good shape now and is available in our main branch. So um, we invite you to check it out and leave us issues for anything that you find is wrong. Other stuff that I did um, included doing some timings of these new ways of accessing the um, bitmap data. And the thing that I was excited to see is we've talked about improving the audio input capabilities of CircuitPython so that we can read in audio at the same time as we do processing. 
And basically with these changes, uh, we would be able to, on the NRF microcontroller, um, keep up with the, um, the incoming audio data, if only we could sample it in the background when we want to do an FFT and show the result on the screen, which is really powerful uh, level of processing for CircuitPython. Um, I did some work related to encoders on the RP2040 microcontroller, and um, also I updated Microlab um, to the newest version of Microlab, bringing that into CircuitPython version 7. So uh, as I mentioned before, that is a big incompatible change, and basically all software using Microlab needs to be changed. At least the imports need to be changed. We will eventually update the guide that we have on that, but we will do it much closer to the time that we release um, version 7. This week my focus is I2S out on the um, RT1011 microcontroller, which will presumably work on the others in the family, although I'm just testing it on the one. Um, and anything beyond that, there is stuff that I would like to improve in the Microlab documentation. Um, and just whatever else comes along. I have a couple of PRs that I need to bring to mergeable state uh, as well. And yeah, I think that wraps it up for me. Um, I guess I do wanna share that I missed the meeting last week because uh, I was getting my COVID vaccination. Had to drive an hour and a half away, but um, it was available and I was able to take the opportunity to do it. So I encourage you to get a COVID vaccination if you can where you live. And with that, uh, I will pass it, uh, let's see, I'll read notes from Jose David and then I'll pass it to Katni. So um, Jose David last week worked on the slider widget. This allows us to control non-discrete things using a resistive screen, PWM voltage and others. And there's a link to a pull request. Uh, also a PR to modify Adabot to make the community libraries page. A styles library, uh, quote, I think it is ready to move out of my repo. There are more links uh, there in the document. A display button library, need to review a PR and modify the examples. And display text, corrected the extra arguments issue. This week, uh, Jose David will start working uh, on the color picker widget and need some assistance from the C graphics folks. And we'll also move the new widgets into new libraries. All right, Katni, you are up, and then K-Match. All right. So uh, last week, published my first solo newsletter. That was successful, um, including all of the miscellaneous things that happened throughout the week uh, related to the newsletter as well. Um, I did some catch-up on some older to-dos that had been missed. Um, it was all stuff I needed feedback on, and uh, so I went through my whole list and, and pinged on a bunch of things and got responses on everything. And um, so I checked off a number of older things on my to-do list, which was good. I have continued on the um, templating quest, uh, which is to create templates of the circuit, uh, the circuit Python essentials guide. And um, then all those will be added to the circuit Python compatible board guides. Um, the idea being that instead of there being a general guide that sort of tells you in general how to do something, um, each board guide will have a set of tailored pages that match exactly what that board can do and have wiring diagrams for that board, et cetera. So um, the f I decided to go the route of doing all the templates first, and then I will dump them into the board guides once I've actually completed the templates. Um, this week, uh, more newsletter stuff. Um, it's going to be uh, the case for a few more weeks um, that there's a lot of newsletter happening. I have great respect for Anne um, and all that she does uh, now that, I mean, I did before, but now that I'm actually doing it, my, my respect has increased. Um, and then uh, once I get the newsletter out this week, I will be starting on the guide for the Neo Trinky, which is a new product we have. And I will be continuing on templating, which is also something that's just gonna be on my list. Uh, for quite some time, because um, it's a huge, huge undertaking to update uh, something like 45 boards, um, guides. So anyway, um, that's uh, where I'm at. All right, thank you. Neil Trinky's so cute, by the way. 
Uh, anyway, but next up is Kmatch, and then after that, Melissa. Good. Thanks, Jeff. So following on with an Into the Weeds topic uh, from last week, I created a document to capture some of the intermediate level or so-called intermediate level memory usage tips, uh, particularly things that folks tend to run into when they're using a lot of graphics or fonts or displaying a lot of text. Uh, so it's open for business and e eager for folks input. Uh, there's a GitHub link here uh, that you can go either raise an issue there or ping me on Discord or or uh, yeah, somehow tag me uh, so I'll take a look at it and I can add it into that. If I misrepresented anything, uh, please please correct that so it can uh, help folks uh, help solve their problems or have a have a place to point folks to something they can read to try and get some ideas of how to solve their issues, as well as supporting in the Discord chats. Um, a, a, a tangential project which isn't exactly Circuit Python, but some of the same folks uh, involved is I've started looking into extending a project that Scott had started almost a year ago on one of his streams called the Tiny Logic Friend. And it's basically how to use uh, existing open source software for visualizing logic analyzer traces called uh, SIGROC and how to interface that with uh, basically any, any Adafruit board. So uh, I'll be working on that or looking deeper how to do that. Uh, and I actually got my first call and response between that software and a an Adafruit board. Uh, so I sent a heart back. I appreciated that. So. <laughs> so anyway, that's what I've got for this week. All right. Thank you. Uh, next up is Melissa and then Scott. Hello. So last week I wrote the new Funhouse library. Uh, I updated some minor issues in the portal-based library as well. Um, I learned... TypeScript enough to fix the library management uh, section of the VS Code CircuitPython extension. Uh, I created a repo for the dynamic bundler. Uh, this week, I'm going to work on trying to get ESP home working and uh, work on the VS Code extension stuff a bit more. And that's all I know that I'm doing for sure. Um, oh, in other news, I finally got my COVID vaccine scheduled because I only be I became eligible today. All right, great. Uh, all right, next is Scott, and then after that, ask Patrick W. Hello. Um, so I created creation IDs, which is a superset of USB IDs for identifying boards over BLE advertisements. Um, I also created a creation, there's an Adafruit CircuitPython BLE creation library as well to go with it um, that shows you how to scan for creation IDs and advertise them. Um, I got that to Trevor. That's what Trevor's using for uh, displaying a really friendly grid of boards that are, are seen by a device um, when you're doing pairing stuff from iOS. Um, I created the prototype file transfer service, which is Adafruit CircuitPython BLE file transfer uh, for transferring files over BLE. I'm starting in Python first, and then we'll, it will get brought into CircuitPython once things have been proven with the iOS side. Um, I'll also plan on writing like a, a thorough readme spec of what the protocol is as well there um, as, a, as a way for to get feedback before we, we put it everywhere. Um, and I had a question for folks, and maybe this is better in the weeds, but if you've done this before, let me know uh, on Discord or something. But I'm looking for ideas for doing generative LED animations, basically um, taking a one to four byte number um, on any particular board and producing like a short, unique animation. And the idea is that um, when boards are advertising, they'll do these unique animations. And in the grid of boards that you see on your phone, the models will actually be animated in the same way so that you can like pick out the thing that's doing a particular animation um, in case you have like two boards of the same type. Um, and then I also want to like, once you initiate the connection, it would be nice if both your phone and the board also showed a, a second different animation to confirm that like the connection that you created is, is the one you expect. Um, so if you've got links to that, let me know. Um, that's kind of like, I, I think I need kind of a like primitive thing that ideally doesn't take too much space up. 
um, but I think it would be really helpful in, in doing Beely pairing. Um, and then the last step, the thing that I have to do later today is I'm presenting on um, I'm presenting on interface design uh, at the Open Hardware Summit on Friday morning. So I've actually got to do I've got to do those slides. So um, yeah, looks like we have a couple ideas. Generally, I after after our RGB LED status flashing the line number, I don't really want to do I don't really want to do just like flash counts. Um, but I also don't want to do just purely color either, because color is something that not everyone can perceive. So a, a mix of blinking and having different numbers of lights and stuff is all pretty interesting. Um, and it may vary based on like board's capabilities as well, like whether it's a single single color LED, like there's not, not a whole lot you can do with flashes. But um, yeah, I think it would be cool kind of to have like a standard, like here's some code that is in all these different languages that given a particular number can can produce a seed and i think it does need to re repeat as well um because i don't want to try to sync up the phone side with the device side so it should just repeat anyway yeah i don't want to go too in the weeds when i'm not in the weeds <laughs> all right i guess in that case uh it's time for ask patrick w followed by dan Hey there, I've been slowly working on the Azure IoT for the circuit, the, um, it's actually CPython sockets format that uh, was implemented into request and then in MQTTT. Um, originally, I was waiting for an ESP32 SPI based board and I got all that. I think, you know, postal service shipping in the United States has been weird. Um, but anyway, getting that working just to see the uh, sort of quote unquote original working did require changes and I've got that working um, and it works with IOT hub, but it does not work with IOT central. And if you don't know what that is, one is the pass offering and one is the SAS offering for Microsoft. Um, and I'm sort of stuck there and I'm basically uh, just whittling away at it, try to get underneath the library and figure out what's going on and why that's different. It's something that's specific to IoT Central, obviously. Um, but anyway, once that is working, I will then switch over to getting it working on the native Wi-Fi, the ESP32 S2. Um, but you know, this is all like a slow background thread for me. Um, and then one sort of ask for maybe MicroDev or Bruce um, on the ESP30, on the ESP IDF update to version 4.3, if there's anything that I can help with or if anybody else can help with, let, it, let me know. Um, for those of us on M1 Max, we're still having to manually uh, work around that. Um, but also, there's also goodness in the in the IDF update as well. All right. Uh, thanks for that. Next is Dan, and then I have uh, notes from David and Deshipu. Thank you. OK, uh, so last week, I think Wednesday night, I released 620RC0. Um, we haven't had any. Though there are bugs, the only one that seems to be a showstopper that we should really fix for 6.2.0 final is the uh, Mac OS, Mac OS mouse HID problem, which I mentioned previously. So given that there's that just one change and we've um, tested it, uh, we may go ahead and do just 6.2.0 final in the next day or two, or zero to two days, I guess I would say. And uh, instead of doing an RC1, I know it would be good policy, but we tend to, we can always do a 621 if something gets messed up. Um, when I was doing 620 RC0, there were some untested changes in the uh, GitHub Actions stuff that has to do with generating automated changes to sort of python.org, and they didn't pan out. And so I ended up um, sort of scrambling around on Wednesday night to, um, fix up circuitpython.org, there are like three or four different problems, but that's all fixed now. Um, there's a thing, uh, there's another USB thing. I turned off something called USB remote wake up, which says whether a device can or cannot wake up um, the uh, host device. It turns out that um, tiny USB doesn't quite support that on all platforms yet, so we really should turn it off. Uh, I found out about this problem because I read all the MicroPython uh, issues and bug pull requests. And it's important to track MicroPython because uh, they have a lot to do with us, obviously, since we're forked from them. And then I proposed this 
uh, idea which sounded good at the time, but was kind of a bad idea about treating an interrupt as a Python exception. Um, Worry of Wire pointed out some problems with it, um, but it provoked a really good discussion on Sunday in the Discord chat about how in, what should we do with interrupts. And I, this is really important because I want to keep provoking this discussion and come up with a simple and sane way to deal with interrupts without providing a tool that makes it easy to um, hurt yourself, given our, our, our subject audience. So uh, I'm really happy about that. OK. All right. Um, so after the notes that I have to read, we will go to Foamy Guy. Uh, David Gloud reports uh, trying Blinka on a Pi Zero to see if Mike Circuit Python code works there. Testing LED shim code on Pi Zero with Blinka and Feather RP2040. Trying to find a uniform naming for Pi Zero, like the 20 by 2 pinout, see the in the weeds topic and trying to figure out what are the differences and when to use Adafruit ST77089 or Adafruit RGB Display.ST7789. Next, notes from Deshifu. I'm doing research for making another handheld game console, this time with a 3.2 inch screen and hopefully much better sound and controls. Still struggling with some decisions and some experiments that need to be done. Fluff Micro, a Fluff M0 in an Arduino Pro Micro form factor for easy replacement in projects, and some progress on the MIDI Ocarina. All right, next is Foamy Guy, then Higher Effect. Can't hear you, Foamy Guy. All right, I'll read the notes uh, from Foamy Guy. Last week, put together a new page for the Custom Fonts Learn Guide that talked about the Bitmap font library and showed a few example, examples of ways it can be used. Testing and review of the new Cartesian widgets and other display I.O. related PRs. And implemented basic cursor rendering and movement in the Tiled Map Helper class. This week, worked on point click with cursor to move tile map game mechanic and streaming one hour earlier this week, Saturday, 9 a.m. Central, uh, due to a vaccine shot appointment in the afternoon, for which yay, yay each time. All right, uh, Higher Effect is next, and then Hugo gets to round it out. Alrighty, um, so last week, um, I laid out the boilerplate for the RP2040 alarm system and uh, started digging into the sleep docs on that, looking for gotchas. Um, I found and resolved an issue with the objects uh, returned from light sleep versus the objects that are added to the global array for light sleep, which were different. Um, I've resolved that for STM32, but that should ideally be resolved for all of the different ports. Um, I fixed uh, a remaining issue with the STM32 where objects weren't being returned properly from deep sleep, which had to do with, I don't even remember what it had to do with. It was, it was complicated and weird. Um, uh, I submitted a STM32, the STM32 alarm PR for final testing and review. Finally, yay! Um, and uh, I've been catching up on the interrupts discussions, um, as they may have implications for the alarm API and other power-related stuff. Um, so, uh, hoping to see some more discussion on that um, this week. I'm going to be putting in the alarm RP2040 alarm system. Uh, getting a control going, um, putting in the initial implementation and testing that. Uh, I'm going to be retesting the uh, changes to audio PWM IO today. Hopefully, uh, just get to merge that. Um, I'm laying out some internal changes to the uh, alarm structure. Uh, well, I'm, I'm planning them. I'm going to run them by Dan um, and see if they're viable going forward to simplify the internal APIs, which People don't see, but they're kind of important just because we have to maintain them and things are a little bit roundabout right now. So hopefully we can simplify that. Um, I've got some CI fixes uh, that need to go to the STM32 PR apparently. And um, amid all that, I'm going to be moving to Boston, uh, back to Boston um, post uh, COVID here. So um, hopefully that won't disrupt things too, too much, but um, 
yeah, it would be good to be back in an office. And that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, all right, Hugo, tell us what's up. All right. Um, so last week I did some pull requests based on infrastructure changes that were pointed out in the contributing page on the Circuit Python website. So failed checks, GitHub actions, things of that nature. Uh, this week I got some feedback from Tommy guy on a PR head open. So incorporating that and looking for otherwise other issues I can help uh, probably do some PR reviews or however I can help there. And interestingly, since I've had a drawn out battle between push to talk on Discord and Windows, I found out that remapping caps lock to a high number F key and using that to push to talk actually surprisingly works. So there you go, my push to talk dilemmas. I hope. All right. We all knew that keyboard was you or that key was useful for something, but we just disagree on what it is. With that, uh, we will move to the final section called In the Weeds. So this is the time for longer form discussion, and I think you kind of know how it goes because you've already added a number of topics. So um, I will pass things to Ask Patrick W. to introduce the first topic. Thank you. Um, this probably won't take too long, but I thought it was discussing rather than just handling. Um, thanks for fixing my typos, Dan. For uh, rather than just tucking in a GitHub issue. So there, I, as I was working on Azure IoT, I found that there, the library itself used Adafruit logging. And so I added that to requirements.txt, but that broke the build because Adafruit logging is meant to be CircuitPython. And if you were running uh, Azure IoT library on, let's say in Blinka, you would use the uh, CPython logging library. So that broke the build for that. So that I then opened this issue um, in the circup library, which is that for there's there's essentially two thing two conversations going on there simultaneously. One is that um, we need a way somehow to express a requirement that is circuit Python only. Um, and Maker Melissa had a good suggestion of using the like environment dash requirements that text format. And you'll see this in projects where they do that for dev or use it for test. Um, and that's pretty common. So I think that makes sense. I think we just should sort of get like group thumbs up on that. And the suggested was circuit Python um, dash requirement.txt and then requirement.txt would be requirements, I should say, dot text would be for quote unquote C Python. Um, they kind of own that one. So I don't think we would change that. Um, so that's one thing. And then there's a kind of another kind of underneath in that thread, which is should we switch circup to use the JSON that is being generated in the um, bundle generator, um, which I'm not really for or against that. It's just, a, I think, more a thought of, well, are we saying all bundles should have a JSON now? And that's our approach. Um, so those are my two subtopics for this. Uh, the JSONs generated automatically now when bundles are created, so they will all have the JSON. But there's uh, yeah, one of the things in Circup that I was talking about, um, Scott, was uh, in, there's a there's a wish that someday there'll be more than there'll be a third party bundle. So are we saying, oh, bundles, even if they're not created by uh, the Adafruit build system, that they should have the JSON? I think that's kind of my um, question versus requirements at tax is just like people do that already. Well, I'm trying to make it so that a lot of the plugins use the JSON. So I think having that as a requirement is a good idea. And I'm fine with that as long as it's like what people, what the community wants. Yeah. And I mean, I would like, I would like to see third party bundles still use the same bundle tooling. It's mainly just like the name of it. Okay. Um, but, but ideally like all the, all the infrastructure and the tooling around it would be the same. So like if Pimeroni or SparkFun have their own bundles or the community bundle, like it should still use all the same things, uh, and work the same way as the Adafruit bundle. So then how do we handle, um, uh, I mean, since essentially the JSON is just the requirements uh reformatted you know well it does include the, it includes more information because it includes the sub dependencies uh how do we 
does this environment dash requirements, CircuitPython dash requirements make sense to do that as well? Yeah, and I would update the JSON to use that uh, CircuitPython requirements one. So we do, okay, and then Circuit would then process CircuitPython requirements JSON. Uh, either that one, or you could have it processed out of the JSON directly. Yeah, it would be the JSON. I mean, we would switch it to use the JSON, but would there be, I guess we just have to work out the format of the CircuitPython specific requirements, like in the example of where the library is CircuitPython only, because there's a C Python library that you should use if you're doing um, Python and using Blinka. Right. Uh, I guess another question is, should we make the circuit Python requirements only have the things that are um, in addition to what you would normally have on the requirements.txt? Um, so that's interesting because today we, I have to ignore, I mean, I say I, 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 up the, I added the feature for dependencies to circuit, um, but it's ours. Uh, the, uh, I have to, I'm ignoring things that are, that I know, for example, are not CircuitPython, like Blinka, and there's one other one that I can think, I can't think of off the top of my head. So I'm already sort of like ignoring stuff there. And I wonder if Circup should, like if it should be more of an even split, like CircuitPython requirements.txt is for all things that are CircuitPython only, and requirements.txt is for all things that are um, CPython and not mix the two anymore. Oh, I see what you're saying. So that we don't have to worry about ignoring it anymore. Yeah. And then maybe even the names, like the name in the libraries, the li the name of the library and the CircuitPython requirement can be the CircuitPython name. Hmm. Like the name of the folder, I got you. Yeah. I would I would caution against having copies of all the requirements in two places. I, I think treating requirements.txt as the like all of the all of the implementations need that or all of the environments need these things means that like if you add a dependency like you you usually only have to add it in one spot right that was my thought on that was the maintainability yeah but you get a you can't add adafruit to you can't add adafruit logging or any other circuit.txt it breaks the build for that um right that's what the circuit python requirements would be for is adding that sort of stuff into right so only Okay, so it'd be it would be always process requirements at text, ignore all the things that are not CircuitPython specific, and then layer on top CircuitPython dash requirements that text. Yeah. But the JSON building process would be the one place this logic lived and not in CircUp or each program processing the JSON. Yeah, we just gotta uh, decide how it works. Okay. That'll make it simpler on everything else. Okay. I think I think we have an answer then. Which I th I I think you may want to just move to like some circuit python requirements json instead. Uh that matches the the, the resulting circuit json format. Cuz the problem you're going to run into with and with circuit python requirements is that like the things that you put in there are not going to be beyond pypi necessarily. And so the question is what name do you use? That's like you're a really, good idea. You're really going to use the name that's going to end up in the JSON. You're not going to use the one that matches like a requirements TXT format. Yeah, because the circuit Python requirements.txt wouldn't be checked on each check-in like the requirements.txt is. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a good point. If we do it in JSON format, then we have less processing to do and less can go wrong. And potentially we could actually add a check for the JSON then. Yes. I also think the uh, that the circuit Python requirement should be optional only if there's stuff that it needs that right. the um, Python doesn't. Right. Because basically we have to say well, like what built in C, C, what C Python built ins we actually need as dependencies. Uh, because in C Python they're assumed to be there, whereas in circuit Python they are not. Yeah, and today I only I uh, I am personally only aware of data for plugging. Right, but, but like, not me another one. Like, 
Like we're also doing like color sys is gonna be one and requests is gonna be weird as well. Yeah. And date time. Um, mm. And date time. Yeah. So I think my proposal would be that yeah, we actually have like a circuit python dash requirements.json file that matches the JSON format that that is in the bundle. It's just like a, a much smaller much smaller thing. Well, is it complete or is it incomplete? And in does it relist the things that are in requirements.txt? That's a good question. And does it list only the top level dependencies? Still, you have to those dependencies. Yeah. I think it should only list top level dependencies because otherwise, when you add an intermediate level dependency, you have to go change everything that, that used it. Whereas the build system. Right that sees the whole bundle can resolve it if that's useful. Right. Yeah. So the, the, another wrinkle in this, since we're in the weeds, this is, is deeper than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> the, the other wrinkle is that Python is really moving towards like pyproject.toml files. Hmm. Um, I was going to add that to that bug. And they include requirements there as well. So like the problem with requirements.txt is there's actually like other places requirements end up, like set up to pi and pyproject.toml. Um and I think the world is is trying to trying to end up in a pyproject.toml world. So it might actually be worth to just do I think you can extend the top level kind of sections of pyproject.toml and we could just add a circuit python section into there um and then at least even if you have dependencies duplicated you have them duplicated in the same file um but maybe that's a big <laughs> that that takes a small change and makes it even bigger well it's it's really confusing right now because there are some projects where the dependencies and set up that pi somewhere it's in requirements of text and somewhere it's implied in pi project at Tomal. and how project right. that work, works varies depending on what you're doing whether you're doing a local or a remote pip install i don't understand this yet and somebody it's not well explained anywhere that i've found right and this but, is like yeah the whole reason we have a bundle in the first place is like python doesn't know what they're doing with packaging so like Let's just do the simplest thing for CircuitPython. <laughs> um, and I don't disagree with that at all. And I think, you know, it could be one thing today. Right. You know, another three months or so. Yeah. So I, I, I you know, we've, we've identified there's only a few libraries this impact. So maybe, maybe the, th the right thing to do is just do a, a CircuitPython JSON file in it that, that we use. And it's like, it'll be easy to find as long as we name it the same. And so if we do want to, like move all of the libraries away from setup to pi to pi project to tumble, like we can do that then. Um, Cause that's a huge amount of work otherwise. Having a JSON format or something like that would also allow to generate any other uh, requirements, whether it's requirements.txt or python.toml, whatever it is as needed as a build task, wouldn't it? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it would allow us to automate it, but if we were just going to use something like Flit or something, then like I don't know how easily you can say like, oh yeah, before you actually do this, like before you read the Pi project to Tom will run this other thing. Like I don't think that's necessarily easy. Yeah, because it replaces the setup.py, right? Yeah. Or sections of it, maybe. Right. Okay, so I think we came to a conclusion that says we would like to create a JSON file for listing the additional requirements within that file. So those are on top of anything that goes in the requirements.txt that supports the essentially using that library mm -hmm. on CPython and via Blinka. Right. And uh, Melissa, can you, I'm assuming you'll take point and define like what that looks like since you're handling the JSON stuff. Sure. And then when if when that's implemented, then I'm happy or anybody can do it too. I don't own circa can come by and swap 
circuit to use the JSON bundle, and then we will can have we can drop the requirements.txt from the bundles just because you know we don't need the same information twice. All right. Well, before we move on, um, David had put some uh, questions in the text chat. One of them got covered, um, but I'll just read out the other two, and if we have a quick response. So uh, first, can we get the example and simple test with a circup command? That's what I will do just after downloading the library. And I know the answer is not right now, um, but uh, is that like on anybody's roadmap? Anything else to say about that? Well, if it's important to you and there's not an issue filed about it, I recommend filing an issue on CIRCUP and maybe somebody will implement it. Uh, then the second one question was, what about built-in library? How does CIRCUP know if it's frozen or not? And the answer is it doesn't. Um, as far as I know, for instance, the Adafruit bus device, uh, which is not strictly speaking frozen, CIRCUP installs that if it's called for in a requirements.txt, whether or not it's already present on the device. And that's just the way it is. And for most devices, it doesn't matter because we've got the spare um, space available on the CircuitPy drive. So uh, does anybody have something they want to add to that before we move on? Yeah, I, th I think if I'm understanding correctly, David, it, uh, there, since Pi zero is not a circuit Python board, meaning it doesn't manifest the a, a, a volume circuit Python, that there's nothing then for circuit to install. In fact, circuit will just fail to run at all if it doesn't see a volume circuit Python available. Um, so you would then use pip. All oh, right. but you can't because it's a circuit Python library. So yeah, I, I don't know why you'd run a circuit Python library in um, you would use the the C Python version of that library, like instead of Adafruit logging, logging. Well, I think the idea may have been, well, suppose I'm familiar with CircUp, but not PIP. Can I use CircUp anyway? And the answer is no, not right yeah. now. I mean, I've just moved to Blinka, and yeah, I have to find a way to do it. And I was super happy with the thing I was doing outside of a single board computer. <laughs> so I have to find which library I have to download, what's the full name on the PIP site. And it's a bit more complicated because it's different from what I used to do. That's the only thing. <laughs> All right. Well, David, I it seems that your mic is working. So do you want to go ahead and introduce your next topic? Yeah, um, so um, I've got two points. The first one, maybe we can just do it in the chat with Mediza, but it, I have that um, mini Pi TFT that I use both on CircuitPython and on the Raspberry Pi and on the Raspberry Pi with CircuitPython or with the CircuitPython library. And then I'm, um, the parameter were not the same. And I think hey, there was a mistake and I was not using the same library to access the screen. And I don't know why I was using one or the other and why they are different. So I was like, okay. Um, and the parameter to offset the pixel are not the same. So I was saying, hey, wait, there is a mistake in the library. Oh no, it's not the same library. Okay. So, um, this is the just... yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, uh, if, if you have the answer, yeah. <laughs> it's historical. Okay. So and which the, one? Which one should I use? So, <laughs> so the RGB display one is pre. It predates Display IO. Um, it, it's kind of like the frame buff model. Um, my bias is to use the other one because it's. I think Display IO is good, and now we actually have some Blinka support for it as well. Um. But yeah, it's 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 just historical that we have both. Okay. Um, okay, and then and then the other story is so I'm trying to use the same code on um, various boards which have the same pinout or the same socket, like a two by twenty on the Raspberry Pi, which a lot of single board computer have, 
and some of the adapter I have also have so that I can put a feather and have the pin like on a Raspberry Pi. Um, and so I wanted to have a single naming and I figure out that on the Raspberry Pi Zero, um, we use the BMC numbering, which is not the physical location numbering, and it's not the silk numbering, which is the physical numbering. And we use DXX, like on CircuitPython board. Um, but some board, or at least one board, maybe the Coral Google something board, use GPIO um, underscore P for physical location. And that's great because it's, it's it's the same numbering as on the silk and it's not D like in use and with conflicting values on the feather side. And so I was wondering if we could have GPIO underscore P a number, which is the physical location of the pin on that connector for all the board which have that kind of connector. And then if somebody wants to write code for hat or a fat or a bonnet or whatever the name, the same code will always work. I, I think it's a really good idea. Um, one thing, I, I think it's a bit long. So maybe you could just call it pi XX, like whatever the number is for that two by 20 is like the standard pi header. Maybe I would just call it that. Um, I don't know. In general, I don't think it's labeled very well on the, the on the actual pies, so um, it, it's messy on Raspberry Pi side because with those numbering, um, it's 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 a mess, and they've changed from one version of Pi to another version, so uh, no doubt. But um, yeah, they changed the numbers they call it between. They've changed the BMC right. pin for the same physical location at some point or something like that. Right. So I think I, I think it's like I would just take the same approach that CircuitPython does is like the BMC is the Broadcom name or number and that should be usable, but you should also be able to use just the Pi number, right? Like the the number on the two by twenty connector. Um, and I would probably call it Pi to make it clear. Like kind of the prefix is the namespace. Or number space. Scott, do you want to say I, anything about I, whether that would conflict with uh, Feather's use of DXX for the GPIO pins? Because I'm not sure why that would be a conflict. Um, I think just don't have the twenty pin or the forty pin header. Right. I don't. I don't. I wouldn't consider it a conflict. I just generally don't like A and D as prefixes, <laughs> um, largely because they imply incorrect data in, at times, <laughs> right? Like A pins can still be used digitally usually now. And like, yeah, I just don't think it's a very good prefix. So I think my my pick for a prefix for the the numbers on a pi two by 20 connector would be pi, pi. So you would have All pi. All hmm? uppercase or pi with a lowercase i. I would do all all uppercase okay. to match, but um, it doesn't actually matter. the The idea is just pick one and be consistent. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's a good idea. Um, this is exactly why I need to cover this in the talk that I'm going to give on Friday. Um, I've I've just checked a few single board computer, and all the single board computer I have are from Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. So um, like I I don't have a bigger boom or a coral or a Jetson or whatever. So it's and I, 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 I could check in the pin.py to see what's in use, but there is a lot of indirection. So like it, oh you've got that MCU, then it's the same as this board and so it's mm -hmm. very difficult without the board to know what's available really. Um, or I need right. to better understand. <laughs> but I think I, I think because the Raspberry Pi kind of established it, that connector, I would suspect that, um, yeah, the mapping internally will be different, but the naming of just like 
pi one through forty will will be consistent. Um, or whatever the pi pinout yeah. names and call for it. Most stuff, for most stuff, it's SPI or it's uh, Eric stakes or it's uh, I2C. And so it's OK. But a lot of uh, hat, they also use other GPIO for clicking LED or whatever. So then, and that's where it's become more difficult, mm. of course. Right, for the ones that aren't on the connector? Yeah. The main so, reason why we're going with the D numbers is so that you didn't have to change your sketches as much to go back and forth between CircuitPython and Blinka. But it's not the same number. It's D, but it's another digit. So. Right. I mean, like, for instance, if you have D4 or something like that, then there's usually one on, like, a Feather and a Raspberry Pi. Yeah, I, I, I don't I, I I think I think it's important to not try to draw like those are those are two different interfaces, right? The feather interface is different from the pi interface. Right? Like they're physically different. Yeah. Um yes. and I think that means that like it's better to not try to have names that cross over those. There, of course, is like the standard buses are probably exceptions to that, where you want SDA and SEL potentially. Um, if 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 another interface, like if another form factor also designates those two pins, like they should be named the same, obviously. Um, but generally, I I I would go uh, I would bias towards being more specific in the prefix that you use. So D and A are generic, GPIO is generic. So something like pi would make it clearer um, that you're talking about the pi two by 20. And what other physical form factor that is like that, like de facto standard? Um, because we don't have the problem with the micro bit or the clue because there is only one for the moment mm -hmm. and if there is another clue then i guess you're gonna make it right <laughs> um are there other kind of standard connector where this kind of problem could exist or i'm sure there are and that yeah i'm sure there are um but like Arduino and Raspberry Pi are by far the two largest, I think. Maybe like Nucleo, like the Nucleo boards have pretty consistent pinouts um, as well. Like they have like three different sizes of Nucleo boards that are in the same form factor otherwise. Um, so yeah. yeah. Another one I, that comes uh, comes to mind is this uh, M2 form factor series of boards from SparkFun. Uh, right, fact, the Micromod. Like uh, sometime last fall, PT had put together a list of, I think, three different companies that were coming out with microcontrollers in that form factor. And there was very little agreement, like even down to which pins were power and ground. So that's not a standard. It's just some things that have the same cutout on the edge. Right. But that's what happens when and, when advanced communication about what you're doing is not um, happening. With Adafruit parts, we've got the Itsy Bitsy family, um, the Cutie Pie family, the Feather family, their Metro family, and we I was try to be good about the... them for in terms of consistency. We do the best we can because we recognize the importance of it. But <laughs> other people don't do I... the same job. Sorry, David. I'll stop talking over you. Yeah, I, I was confused about the itsy bitsy because um, I was thinking it was like the Tinsy, and so I was hoping to be able to use the Tinsy to feather adapter for my itsy bitsy, and apparently it's not the same thing at the same location. So no, I think, it's not. wait, <laughs> it's this exactly the same spacing between the pins, and it's not. So I say, oh god, so. Yeah, I feel you. This is exactly <laughs> why I want to do a presentation on it. Of like, think about this when you're introducing a new form factor. I mean, sometimes people don't even think like they make one board and they don't expect to make a second one in the same form factor. So there's all these 
um, these things that they don't think ahead for. Um, like, I'm just thinking of Unexpected Maker and, and the ESP boards that he creates. Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a good point. It's early I, days, that, I think. Yeah. Well, so that's the thing. You have to be early on the ball when there is a new format so that it's consistent. Yep. Um, like for the Pico, the, the, the Pico, maybe they're going to make other boards with the same form factor because there is already a certain number of accessories for the Pico that you can put on top or below yep. or whatever. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. That's, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to do a PR on the um, blink, I think, for the P uh, numbering. Okay. And, yeah. Yeah, that would be good. I mean, ideally, it would match silk numbering too, but that's not a, that's not under our control. But I'm okay having alternative numberings as secondary names. And we have space in the memory of a Raspberry Pi. Oh yeah. <laughs> yep. All right. Uh, next, we have a topic from Jose David, who is text only regarding issue 4516. Uh, I saw some discussion regarding the size of lists. Is there any guideline on how much data we can put in a list? Why is the limit higher for dictionaries? I've used dictionaries with over 2,000 entries, three items for each entry, all ints. So was 3516, I don't remember what that was. I think this is the pi stack exhausted when creating okay. a list. Yeah. And I don't think it's deliberate at all. I think it's just an artifact of the way it's implemented. And um, it's just, it's, it's for literal lists and dictionaries. Not the size of a, a list in Not all. the size in general. Mm -hmm. you, can, you could make a dictionary that's large and add things to it one at a time or whatever, so. Right. Yeah, my, my yeah, I was just like, oh, that's, it's a consequence of moving to the pie stack, and it's probably that that code should just switch to not doing it on the stack if it's that large. Yeah, I don't know how easy it is to change what a list literal does. I mean, that would be what does the byte compiler do and all these sorts of things that I think we'd be reluctant to dive into when there are workarounds like having your data come from a file or uh, right. so forth. Uh, for mm -hmm. that particular use case, for having a large literal list, you, you're going to start caring about like how much uh, does the bytecode, how much storage does the bytecode take, because that might become a substantial fraction of your RAM. And so doing something right. else, I think, would be the better uh, thing to do. Right. And I kind of suspect that's the case of like, it's in the constant table that goes along with the bytecode, and then it gets copied to the stack because you might mutate it, something like that. My impression was that if you have that that list, that it can it contains an instruction that says push the first element of the list, push the second element, push the third, mm -hmm. and so on mm -hmm. for a thousand times, and then it says make a list with a thousand items. Right. That's partially what I know from standard Python, and just mm -hmm. guessing on the fact that that uh, is is kind of the same with a list. Anyway, it's just a guess as to what's going on. Yep. But yeah, that's, yeah the, that's the consequence is it uses a stack that's proportional to the size of the list and the tuple and I suspect the, the dictionary, but I'm not sure. Maybe dictionaries are different. All right, uh, Jose David's second topic. Now that we are moving some widgets out of the display IO layout library, could we add more features? Widgets were in the light side because they were in the display IO layout library. Yeah, so I think this is, I just thought that this was the approach folks were taking of like putting widgets in display layout. And so I asked them to be moved to separate libraries. And I so I would say, yeah, of course, you can add, you can add more features now that they're separate. Um, I don't know if Foamy Guy or Kmatch have further ideas on that. But generally, I think, I generally, I think we should keep library small because it makes them easier to find um like it's far it's hard to find all the widgets under display io layout because i would assume display io layout was layout related stuff not the widgets themselves yeah i don't, I don't know if you can hear me i kind of stepped away yep. and just popped back in but um i 
think it sounds like what you're talking about is splitting layout. And I'm definitely on board with that. We, when we very, very first um, asked about it and started talking about it, we were talking about um, calling it GUI. And I think we switched it because the first thing we had was more of a layout mm. and we had in mind to make more, more layouts. And what we've kind of right. gone on to do is add a bunch of widgets. Okay. Yeah, because my assumption with the layout library is like you're going to have like horizontal layout, auto wrapping layout, like vertical yeah. layout, that sort of stuff. Yeah. And the grid, I think the grid layout fit that. And we have right. um, linear. I don't know if linear layout ever got added, but I have one of those floating around somewhere. Okay. Right. Yeah, that's the sort of thing I would expect in this library. And then the things that match that interface that, that the layout stuff needs, like that can still be separate repos. I know there's a bit of an overhead to separate repos, but I still think it's better in the long term. Um, yeah, it sounds good to me. Do you have a preference between like uh, Adafruit CircuitPython widgets versus Adafruit CircuitPython GUI? No, I would just pick one. Okay. Just make it consistent so that it's clear that like all of the all of the repos that have this prefix match this interface and work with this with Display IO layout. Okay. Cool. Yeah, we can spin that up this week. Yeah, that'd be cool. Would you want a prefix like layout or display IO to be in the repo name? Yeah, display IO, I think for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine with me. All right. Um, if that wraps up that discussion, then uh, Dan, your topic is up. Uh, I just briefly. So um, I opened an issue 4542, which is linked in the notes, which asks that people who, th who have an idea that for using interrupts in CircuitPython, that they need something that involves interrupts, and they might code it using interrupts in, say, MicroPython or Arduino, that they write up their use case and put it, or put it in issue 4542. Um, we don't have to discuss that now. This is going on for quite a while, but um, it would be nice to collect lots of different use cases because I can think of some, but it was great to have people suggest their use cases and then sometimes they suggest mechanisms too. So just look at that issue if you're interested. Okay. That's and it. thanks thanks for driving that. It's it, like all the internet, interrupt folks are really hard to like make them take a step back and what they're figure out what they're trying to actually do. Right, right. I'm trying to, I was trying to be kind of specific. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Thanks. Yeah, we'll crack this nut. All right. Yeah, uh, this is Warrior of Wire. I just oh, wanted hello. to say thanks. Hey, hi. Uh, just wanted just wanted to say thank you. Uh, I, I hope I don't come across as too uh, brusque on my issues. Sometimes, <laughs> uh, sometimes I, I uh, give a, an ocean of words and it can be a little overwhelming. Um, but uh, I just wanted to say thank you, and I, I super appreciate you uh, uh, putting out ideas and having discussion on this. Um, it, it's uh, it's greatly appreciated. No, I, I don't mind at all. That's that's fine. I mean, you explained yourself, and you did a great job explaining. You know the reason. I, that was that was really helpful. Uh, and I I I, I want to stir things up and get people to think about it in unusual ways. I just want. MicroPython, you know, MicroPython is interrupts. Why don't you do that? And there's a reason. And uh, it, it, to think about, like, well, considering that async I/O, for instance, which is not exactly interrupts, has like two or three substitute libraries because people find the original one difficult. I think that we can think about things in that way too. Like, how can we make it? That's it. I think you did a great job of having a strong opinion while still being polite, which I think is uh, a great skill to have. So, um, yeah, not something that every community does. So, good on that. Yeah, super cool. Um, if we end up wanting to talk about it more, um, feel free to at me. Um, yeah, I, I have strong opinions, but uh, <laughs> I need to find some time to actually uh, put some uh, C uh, into it and that's uh, like actually play with it. Um, I have some ideas, but um, yeah, probably uh, whoever starts writing C first is uh, is going to win. <laughs> well, free, feel free to write out those ideas because we have a lot of folks interested in it. It's possible that somebody else may pick it up before you get a chance to actually implement it. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've suggested some sample APIs, and I think even if they're not implemented, that's fine because I think it, it makes people think about how they 
might use those or whether they need a variation on it, something like that. Great. I really like writing example code that doesn't work just to see what the example code would look like. Right. When I was doing that, I, I realized um, problems with a couple of the, the like naive ideas, like uh, having a having a context manager um, to say, hey, no interrupts are allowed inside of here. And it's like, if your interrupts, like if you have too many of them or if they arrive too quickly, um, <laughs> you can you can interrupt your way out of your context handlers all the way out the top of your application, and you know you just have a a race condition with your with your interrupts, or you have to uh, like allow yourself to miss interrupts if they arrive too quickly, um, which also may not be desirable. Um, yeah, there's um, there's there's a lot into the weeds we could go with this, but uh, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a good it's a good topic. And last, we have a topic from Katni. All right, we can keep this quick. Um, so we're going to turn this into either a learn guide, I just linked it in the chat, or a learn page. Um, does anybody have thoughts on whether they think it's enough content for a standalone guide, or do we think we're going to expand on it at some point, at which point it probably makes more sense to have it as a standalone guide? Or should we um, just add it as a page to the welcome to circuit python guide my preference would my preference would be to have a separate guide okay that's kind of what i thought too i just wanted to get a second opinion on that and i think yeah i think the reason is that there's a lot in the welcome to circuit python guide already yeah um and people do get lost in those weeds sometimes so i think generally More than sometimes like, yeah, so I, th I think having a separate guide, and like you say, like that gives us the flexibility to expand it and split it into separate pages and that sort of stuff, too. I agree. It's a separate guide because I think it's going to help that stand out, and it would also appeal to people who are more advanced as well, too. Yeah, that's what I, I thought. And it, it feels like something that other folks may have stuff to add to it um as time goes on and like this may turn into one of those guides where the more that we the more features that we add that help this particular issue the more that we need to add to this guide so people yeah. plug in a search term like um uh memory saving would that if it was in the original guide would it even come up or or will... yes oh it, it still would come up for free. yeah if it was a page in a guide it would still come up um you might okay. not know to click on that guide because you would just see the welcome to circuit python in the description of the guide but it would come it would bring it up if you if you punched it in yeah. I, I if we if we have a um like cross references the guides are good and i think you might even think about it, like can we prune the current like the non uf2 bootloaders page for instance you know maybe that should be its own guide just in terms of to reduce the number of things on the left-hand column or something like that. Like if some, a beginner like doesn't even know like what the heck is he talking about. And so right. in, in the in the long run, yeah, maybe that it would be like slimming down the existing guide and putting pointers off to specialized guides that are not referred to very often or something. Yeah, like that's a possible. Index of extended yeah. topics or something like that. At the end. Yeah, and to back off of what Dan was just saying. Uh, putting things like that in a beginner guide can also tend to scare off beginners like, oh, wait, I have to think of all these things as opposed to just five minute, you know, get that first blinking LED, get that first win. For sure. I, I agree completely. Um, yeah, that was all. Sounds good. Um, my topic's over. <laughs> all right. Thanks, you, Katni. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to wrap up the meeting because uh, we have been at this for about an hour and a half. Um, so time to find my end of meeting spiel. Thank you, everyone. This has been the CircuitPython Weekly Meeting for April 5th, 2021. Thanks to everyone who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at, at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. 
The next meeting will be held next Monday at the usual 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific time. The meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord server, which you can join by going to adafru.it slash discord. The uh, chat is 24-7, but the meeting is on Mondays. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the Circuit Pythonista's role on Discord. We hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.